My name is John Burris. I'm here with Ben Nessenbaum. Uh, we are the attorneys who recently filed a lawsuit uh, against the city of Antioch, alleging um, various forms of civil rights violations, uh, as well as uh, what they call 1981, a race-based discrimination, and, and also a pattern and practice uh, lawsuit. This fact pattern is the most pervasive racial hatred uh, case I've ever been involved in. Uh, that is certainly the kind of thing you have expected, and certainly if I read history books and read a lot of the books in black history, Southern justice and all, um, some Northern, but I've never seen the, the pervasive forms of racial bigotry that was communicated amongst these officers as if it were a cup of coffee. And some of the things they said was so horrific that it certainly made me cringe to think that these are the very people who are supposed to be serving the people of this community. I, knowing what I know now, this community probably should have been more afraid of the police than, than the gangsters or the criminals that were in, in their communities, because these were criminals. And if you looked at how they treated the people uh, in terms of the use of force, they took great pleasure of using excessive force. There's one example where an officer said that uh, I, I tried to kick a field goal uh, with the person's head. Another talked about using uh, the E-40s, which is the less lethal weapons, uh, against the mayor himself. And, and they talked about where they used it on other individuals. And, and one of the things we've always talked about is racial profiling. That is the stopping of African Americans without just cause without sufficient probable cause or reasonable suspicion to justify the stop. Well, it's pretty clear that that was a modus operandi with respect to these officers. They would stop people just because they were black, and they would harass them, they would search them, and ultimately uh, arrest them if they thought that they could get away with it. I thought the more interesting component of it was that when they got confessions, they didn't want any kind of oral, written, videotape of the confession. They wanted the confession to be such that they could make up the confession and convince the superiors that the person had confessed. And of course, uh, the defendant had no way of opposing it. So it was a rampant, deep-seated uh, uh, course of conduct that existed here. And when you think about it, to me, that, that's most egregious is that I listened to the tapes, I heard and read about the tapes, is that there were supervisors, sergeants and lieutenants who were part of the, the text mail uh, list. And unfortunately, they're the ones who were supposed to call into questions and to prevent this from happening. But they did not. So they were part of the conspiracy. And I thought about it is that if, if the supervisors are involved in the conduct, what hope was there for any of the people in this community? because that is who they're supposed to go to, to the sergeants, lieutenants, and these same people in internal affairs. And, and so what we had is a department was totally corrupted racially, that you had officers who were used racial terms that were so bad that even I had come uncomfortable using some of them. But I will just say, this, this is common language as I saw amongst them that they were saying. There were different variations of the N-word, different variations, even old Southern ways of referring to uh, black women. Monkeys, gorillas, faggots, water buffaloes, cunts. Uh, president, uh, uh, that, uh, the president used in terms of describing the private parts of women, uh, Trump, as he's heard about the tape that he had, he referred to the, the men as that and then fat bitches and many others. This conduct itself was so horrible that it was more than just locker room talk. It was a state of mind. And so for us, this was pervasive. And so many of the people that have been affected didn't even know that they were being treated this way. They didn't know that the conduct that they were being arrested for was improper. They didn't know that the physical beatings that they were taking that was unjustified, and yet these officers all knew. They all knew, and they continued to do it unabated and unstopped. 
And so from my point of view, we brought this lawsuit, and part of the lawsuit is not just to show the individual conduct that's taken place, but really to look at the pervasiveness that there was a pattern and practice that existed within this department that allowed for this discriminatory conduct to occur. That has to stop. And the only way it seems to me that you have to eliminate just about all 45, you know, there's at least 45 officers who are on the, 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 the text message train. And all of them, I should none of them protested. This included sergeants and lieutenants. So the words that I talked to you about and the statements that, that were made in terms of how to physically treat people, those were all text messages that were sent out amongst each other. And no one came forward and said that any of that was improper. Well, you can't have a, con a police department where officers feel that they can just do whatever and there's no ramifications for it. There was no accountability, there was no discipline, and in essence, these officers were totally out of control. That in and of itself made it being condoned by the, uh, by the superiors because they should have known and taken appropriate action to prevent this from happening. So from my point of view, that we have to have this lawsuit to at least vindicate as many as we can the individual rights of the persons who've been offended or, or injured, whose rights have been violated. And then we have the issue of the department, and the department itself should be held responsible for the, engaging in this, allowing this type of conduct to occur by ratifying it by failure to do anything. So that, and so, as a consequence, the department should be held responsible. Then the question is, what happens next? What should happen here? Because, you know, there's an age-old issue with departments is, can you police, can you trust the police to trust themselves, police themselves? Obviously, that. Obviously, that's not true here. The police cannot be trusted to, to, to police themselves because they obviously did not do it here, and a lot of people suffered, and this whole community was in fear. So then you have to seem to me you have to go outside. Now, it is wonderful that the FBI is conducting their investigation for criminal conduct that is taking place, and, it's, and the county DA likewise is doing. That doesn't necessarily help the individuals, and it doesn't necessarily hold the department accountable. There may be individual officers who may get prosecuted, and, and we hope most of them get terminated. The real question is what happens to the department, and who's going to police this, this community? And so from our point of view, that's going to require outside intervention. Now, I was involved, not involved, but I, I'm very familiar because I have family on the East Coast of Camden, New Jersey. Camden, New Jersey Police Department was run amok. Well, that whole department was fired. And, 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 the, and the sheriff and the, uh, the, the um, hired members of the sheriff department of the Camden County to come over and run the department. Well, I'm not suggesting that this sheriff department should do that because I don't have a great deal of confidence in them. We've had a number of cases against it. But I also know that you got to somehow rid the rottenness that exists within this department. That means it has to be taken out. And many of you remember the O.J. Simpson case when, when the, art, the lawyer said there's a a uh, cockroach in the spaghetti. And the question is, do you throw out the spaghetti or you throw out the cockroach? Here, you throw out the spaghetti because it seems to me this department is so fundamentally corrupted by the racial biasness that existed within it, that, that has existed that you cannot have these same officers or cannot accept the notion that these same officers have changed and that they themselves would act in a way differently. So, so that to me means we're looking at some form of oversight from either the federal government or, uh, or, you know, or uh, a monitor of some kind. But something has to change. New policies have to be written. Those new policies then have to be uh, officers trained on them. They have to be implemented. And then they have to be called into question on an ongoing basis by careful review. So our, this case is, uh, that we filed here is designed to move the agenda forward that way cannot allow this type of conduct to continue to exist in this community where these people are in, in, in fear or, or not only in fear but are disrespected in the most dehumanizing way. That cannot continue to allow. And so this lawsuit is designed to, to, uh, to take care of that point. Next we have Ben, uh, my partner, and he will talk. Thank you. So about 20 years ago or so, uh, I began working with Mr. Burris. At that time, there was a virus in the Oakland Police Department that generated 
uh, and allowed for police officers in Oakland to run amok in the community, to brag about making false confessions, to, to document confessions that never happened, to beat people up and lie about why they did it. Well, guess what? That virus has made its way to the Antioch Police Department. And that's what these officers admit to doing in their own text messages to each other. Now, is it that unusual? Maybe what's unusual is the light of day is shining upon it. I think that is the difference. Now we know, this is how they talk to each other. And now everyone knows. And what that means is that nobody, nobody from the poorest to the richest person in Antioch can trust or rely upon the Antioch Police Department to do the job that they are required to do, to provide constitutional policing, honest policing, and fair policing. And that has to change. And that change starts now with the filing of this lawsuit. Among other things, we are seeking court monitoring. We need this department to change. It's not gonna change by itself. It's proven that. So what we're asking for is not just damages for each plaintiff who's been affected, but for the department to be under federal oversight, whether that be a court monitor, a court appointed monitor, or some other form, there has to be an enforcement mechanism to that change. We don't see this as something that happens overnight. We see this as a process that may take years. Oakland is still under, under a federal oversight. You know, we hope it doesn't take that long. But as you all know, Oakland has gotten a lot, lot better. And the consent decree, in effect, has ultimately been highly effective and worked very well, not perfectly. But I think that that can happen here, and it should happen here. You know, there are at least uh, two Department of Justice associations that address itself to police departments like this. I've had a chance to, under the Department of Justice, under Section 14141, allows for the Department, Department of Justice to come in and investigate whether or not there's a pattern and practice of discriminatory policing taking place. That has happened in a number of cities throughout the country. More recently, Louisville, you know, uh, Memphis is one, Chicago, uh, Albuquerque. I've looked at them, over 20 of them because I'm looking to see how things are resolved. And I did that before we did the Riders case and I know that the Department of Justice can do it if they want. Likewise, there's another department called the Office of Community Policing. And, and that also comes in and evaluates the department. We did that and I did the case against San Francisco and Salinas. These are departments can come in and take a look and evaluate the department and see what can and cannot be done. I frankly know what can be done and what, how it can be done. And so, of course, we will move along those lines. But the only thing that we can assure you of is the status quo cannot maintain itself here. No, it cannot. And we have to identify what changes we can do. And the first thing is you've got to get rid of these officers who are involved in all of this. And the ones that are left, we have to see if they're salvageable or not. But we certainly have to be concerned that the ones who've been tainted by this because there were at least 45 who were on the email, uh, on the text strand. None of them came forward, and you gotta believe that some of them affected some of the remaining officers who were present. So there's gonna have to be a complete restructuring and, and, and reevaluation of all the officers who are left to see whether or not they are worthy of continuing. And we don't know that yet, but we certainly will hope to find out as we continue to march through. The people that we filed the lawsuit here today, they're not the end. This is just the beginning because we want to know all the other people who had, whose rights were violated uh, during the, by, by these officers and were treated in the most horrendous fashion uh, and disrespectful manner uh, and dehumanizing manner. Those are things we have to find out and we will do so. So next, let me call on, um, next up, who would like to talk first here? Who wants to talk? Come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Is it plain? Uh, yeah, I like I'm a resident. And Hold on to me. I want to find out. Yeah, here we go. Hi, I'm Cordell Smith. 
I've been wrongly accused by Officer, officer Amiri. He was one of my uh, arrest officers. I did 10 months for he saying something I didn't do for his uh, testimony. And at the time, they took him as credible because he was an officer at the time. And it was his word over mine. It's like the whole time I'm in there, I'm thinking like, God, I literally ain't do that. This man literally lying. He literally making up info. I'm, I'm literally telling my attorney this. I'm trying to explain to her. But when it comes to these officers, it's always they word against ours. We always guilty. In their eyes, we guilty. Amir, uh, Amiri, one of the officers he's making reference to, is really one of the major perpetrators of misconduct as he routinely referred to the, the, the community of N-words, in, various phases of that, all kind of the names that I mentioned, those were part of his routine vocabulary and using excessive and physical force, and even noting that he would lie in order to make up confessions if there was no tape recorder. So he undoubtedly is a person whose case has to be looked at. Now, when we did the writer's case, we had to go back and look at over 100 convictions that had taken place by those officers to have them to set aside because they were all bogus and fake. And we'll have to find out how many officers we have, how many cases we have here, maybe like his, where, where these officers that we know engaged in misconduct and used their position of authority uh, to cause people to be arrested in jail uh, for no legitimate reason. Thank you. For sure, thank you. Yeah, you can ask Uh. Well, the precipitous what happened in my case, uh, this my girl, we lived together, and I was basically at her house at the time. They did a, a, a sweep, or they basically kicked down my door and did a search, and this search, they said they found stuff that wasn't mine. And basically ev everything they found on me, I mean, everything they found in that area and the area is you know it's right down the street sycamore and if you know sycamore it's a lot like they just target that area why because it's a lot of blacks uh low income and that's the target and i felt like uh they basically targeted me i think they fabricated the evidence they put everything on me everything they found in that house they put on me like and, and they found evidence outside the house that they put on me. And it's just like, man, they just been harassing me. Uh, I did 10 months for nothing. They took 10 months of my life for nothing. Uh, Officer Mary, uh, man, he, he, he just said he seen me throw something out the window or said I broke something out the window when that wasn't never the case. Like, it's like the whole police report, it was bogus and it, it's crazy. Like, it, it's crazy. And it, it, like, and I'm literally like traumatized behind it. I'm scared of them. Like, when they come, they, they come aggressive. Man, it, it's scary. Like, and yeah, I'm, I'm real traumatized behind them. Did they plant evidence then? Is that what you're kind of implying? I, to be honest, I think they planted evidence because we lived in a certain room together and everything they found was not in my possession, was not near me, and they just pointed, since they wanted me, they had an investigation out on me. It was he say, she say, and once they had the investigation out on me, it was like, okay, let's get him. And it was a bandana. And this has been going on for years. I've been at Antioch residence over 10 years. And from that, we done had history together. It's like they just wanted me. And they was doing everything in their power to get me. And they finally was able to get me. I was finna go to the federal prison. I don't supposed to be out right now talking to y'all. I'm supposed to be in the federal prison. But due to their mistakes and they mess up, I'm here with my beautiful wife and my son. When did this happen? Uh, we keep y'all far. Okay, we gotta talk to you more about it. Okay.
I'm um, Trent Allen's mom, and I am devastated right now with these Antioch police officers that target my son, that text each other comments about my son's head was a bowling ball, that they kicked a field goal, that they was going to shoot him, that they shot him in his neck with a 40. Mm -hmm. These officers need to be removed from Antioch Police Department, and I mean moved. I mean criminal. They need to get, I need justice for my son. They need to be prosecuted because this is unacceptable. And it's been going on for too long because these same officers have been targeting my house, kicking in my door, not having warrants. But I am devastated right now because my son could have been dead. But I'm his voice right now. And it's going to be a change because I will, I will keep using my voice until I get justice for my son. And I thank the Lord because I prayed every day. And I thank the Lord for revealing these officers. I get on the prayer line every morning and pray that these officers would be revealed. I went to court preliminary hearing, every, every preliminary hearing, and I knew these officers was a lie. I went to my prayer line and I told them, pray because it's chaos in that court. And I want justice for my son. Shirell. S H I R E L L E. Cobb, C O B B S. My son's name is Trent Allen. And I think you all know, but a lot of these messages pertain to what they did, what these officers did to Trent, kicking him in the head like, like they were kicking a field goal. Uh, Fortying him in the neck, stomping him, kicking him in his ribs, basically Rodney Kinging him. That's what they did, and they bragged about it. The 40 is a le least lethal weapon that fires out rubber bullets. One of the officers said, I will pay another officer a steak dinner or a dinner if he would MF 40, the mayor. Uh, that shows you the kind of respect they had for the mayor. And, what, and that is their uh, leader. Who's next? Hello. So um, my bout with Antioch Police Department started as soon as I moved here in 2008. Antioch Police kicked in my door, drew guns on my kids before they ever saw my face claimed that I was dealing drugs. I didn't know a soul here. Um, I, I came down my stairs when I heard the rumbling in my house. I'm looking at an infrared beam pointing at me. Um, I asked them who they were looking for. They were in the wrong house. They said me. The funny thing about that is I'm a woman. There were all men in my house. I never saw a search warrant. Um, and then it continued with my son, who was 17 in 2014, he was railroaded by Detective Stanger. My son was placed in a gang. Um, there was a birthday party where a fight broke out at this party. Uh, I'm talking about a brawl. A month later, my son and two other boys that he was not affiliated with were put on trial. Um, a lot of things were said in the courtroom that a jury never heard. Um, my son went to prison. My, my kids are sheltered. My kid, my son has never been in a gang. They came and got my son 15 minutes before his bell rang at school. What gang member goes to school? Um, January 31st, 2023, my son was targeted again. Well, in 2020, he was targeted by Kelly at Nabnet. 
um, accused of human trafficking. My son has never even been arrested for being in the vicinity of anything that has to do with prostitution. Um, he denied uh, a deal, which kind of, I guess, upset them. Um, my son said he wanted to go to trial. My son hasn't seen a courtroom since 2020. All of a sudden, January 31st, 2023, my son is grabbed as he's on his way to work. Um, they said first that he had a warrant. Second, a detective wants to talk to him. Third, you know what happened last night. My son was at work last night. Um, my son had a trial date set for March 13th, 2023. Somehow his public defender, pretender, went and visited my son on a court holiday. That same evening, my son called me and said, Mom, I'm going to take a deal. And I said, what? Um, my son is sitting in prison right now as of March 24th, 2023. There has never been a drop of evidence. There has never been a court hearing. Um, his, his 2014 case, the parents of these defendants were ousted from the courtroom saying that they were going to be used as witnesses, took away their support system. We were never called as witnesses. Mm -hmm. um, this, this drama with this police department continues. Mm -hmm. I had one officer stand in front of my house last year, sticking his tongue out at me, telling me my mama. I asked him, do they do mental health evaluations on them? Because I just cannot believe that this is somebody that we could depend on. I would never call Antioch police for anything. I don't care if somebody was killing me. I would just be dead. So, yes, I, I, I need justice for my kid. My, my son is sitting in prison. He has, my, my son wouldn't hurt a fly. So, I am so glad that this cancer has been exposed and the air continues to hit it, so it continues to spread and get these disgusting humans, inhumans, out of this department. It's disgusting. What's your name and what? My son's name is Tariq Woods. My name is Latanya Marzette. Latanya, L-A-T-A-N-Y-A. Last name Marzette, M-A-R-Z-E-T-T. T E R R I Q U E. Last name is Woods, W O O D S. Thank you. How you doing? My name is Adam Carpenter, and I have been harassed and targeted and railroaded by the Antioch Police Department for over 10 years. I was recently released from federal custody with charges dropped after I was in custody for about 11 months. As of last Friday, the state just dropped the charges. Now, I done paid over $470,000 in bail. They didn't pull it up and took my money off my person. No tickets, violation of all civil rights. Like they have damaged the house. Like they basically ruined my life. I wouldn't be a felon today if it wasn't for any of our police department. What do you want? I'm, I'm 33. When I was first targeted, was around the age of 21 by Stinger. And I remember reading in the report something about you were contacted for the first time and then they stopped you like 10 times. Traffic. They stopped me multiple times, no tickets, you know, just targeted. Not on probation or parole, just basically did, you know, in the wrong way possible. Like, you know, robbed of my dignity, my pride, my self-respect and my self-worth. Allegations were a, a bunch of a bunch of criminal charges. Like, you know, what do you, what, what do you want moving forward? I want justice. I want. I would like to, you know, have my record expunged more so than anything. To be free of the burden. And all the charges were dropped. You said? Yes, after they you did after you did prison time. Well, they dropped the charges after they discovered that the police was dirty, but it's like the feds dropped the charges 
and they released me to have to deal with the state. And the state didn't want to drop the charges because they were saying <clears throat> only one police on the case name wasn't dirty, didn't come up yet. And then once his name came up, then they dropped those charges completely. Who are those officers? Um, Manly, Rombo, Amiri, Duggart, and more cop. Have you read these text messages? Those three, or, three or four of those cops ran out complaint. This case? Yeah. In this case, right here. What, what was your reaction when you saw the way they were talking about people like you around the same time that you were dealing with them? It was wrong. Like, you know, it was wrong, but exactly everything that I was voicing. But you don't have a voice when you deal with a system like this. You know, like to see the police and feel like I have to hide my key and hide my money in my underwear to not be robbed so they don't go in my car and take my possessions out of my car. Like, that's not a good feeling. And did they actually rob you? Did they take your money yes. and, knock it and not document it? Multiple yeah. times. Yes. Multiple times. What happened multiple times? They, they pulled up and pulled me out of the car and robbed me of my money, my, my phones, you know. And they didn't document the No money. documentation, no cash, ticket. Didn't document it. No, not even a parking ticket, a traffic ticket. What's it going to take for you to trust the Antioch Police Department again? There's no trust. To honestly sit here and, and hear the list of names and hear that I've basically been targeted by dirty cops over 10 years ago, they will have to completely reform this whole police station. They need a, a, a clean out. And you just got out. I, I've been I've been home since what April of 2022. I have not been able to get a job or, or obtain any type of employment, as well as still deal with child support issues. So it's like you know, it's basically the system is set for us to fail. Like I've been denied for multiple jobs, and I'm a journeyman by trade, a painter. How are you surviving right now? With the help of my mother. How many kids do you have? I have four. How has this been for your family? It's, it's, it's been devastating. Like living in, in hell, excuse my language. What do you tell your kids? I think that's got to be a principle of what next generation coming up. Well, for me, my son told me that he wanted to be a lawyer so that he could help me, you know? And that was big. But I just, you know, I only could tell him steer clear of the police, you know? It's like, even with rights, you still did wrong, so you, you can't win. It's a lose-lose situation. I, I think what we're getting here is that this is not just a, a one or two year deal here in terms of the mistreatment. This is a long-term pattern that is existing uh, amongst the officers of Antioch PD. Some of the officers he's made reference to that been after doing, dealing with for a number of years are listed here in this complaint. Uh, and if you go back, you will see that they, in fact, were involved with in misconduct and devious conduct for many, many years. That will all have to be dealt with over time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next. We have Shagufa Khan. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shagufa Khan, um, born and raised here in Antioch, community organizer. I was referenced in the text messages. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people ask me why I haven't ra raised awareness and why do I have to come out now. But what I tell those people is that I've been protesting for two to three years knowing that this police department is corrupt, knowing that these officers have been racist and targeting against the black and brown families in this community. Enough is enough. A huge reason why I claimed John Burris, retained John Burris as my lawyer, is because sometimes we need to take legal actions to create changes. And I hope that with everyone coming forward, that justice will be retained.
these officers are not only cruel, but are treating humans like pieces of trash. Mothers are crying for their lost sons. Police officers targeting the community that they are supposedly to protect and serve. They have brutalized sons, daughters, targeted families. And it's really unfortunate that the police in custody deaths weren't enough. It's these text messages that people had to, oh, okay, yeah, now we have to question them because there's racist text messages. It's, it baffles me. It, 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 I'm ashamed to be from Antioch. All these families behind me, they are hurting. And it's time to change. Chief Ford must fire these officers. They do not ever belong to become police officers ever again. So I really hope that positive changes are created from moving forward to this till today. So thank you. I think that what cries out and what I see as part of this case is really the question of change. Is that what has taken place so far is like now is a question of crossing the Rubicon. We cannot allow to go back to. That door has been closed and it's up to us to make sure it does not get river crossed, that the river is not crossed again. So my feeling about this, this case, there's always damages involved, but the biggest damage of all is going to be reform, and that we have a different police department in a short period of time. But the officers who are here now, or who have been part of this, are gone, are in jail, can't be police officers, decertified, whatever. But I think what the people here want to be able to do is to live in an honorable and peaceful way and have their constitutional rights protected like everyone else. And that's what this case is really about at the end of the day. Anyone else? Yeah. Hi, my name is Catherine Wade. And when I read the text, I just feel like my son died all over again. My son was beat 2014 by Kali Brogdon, but it was multiple officers involved, Castillo, Vanderpool, um, Wise Carver, many officers. Amiri. Um, when Amiri. you read that list with all the officers, that first 20, 40, all of those officers beat my son except three, and I don't even know if they did because I can't get police reports. My son was beat five times. I've been out here since 2014 fighting for justice for my son. And for Antioch police to use my son to start the grades, and you gave him a percentile of 84% deadly force, Something is wrong. I witnessed Kali beating my son in the buttocks 2014, and him and Amiri, Amiri held his legs apart while Kali beat him again in, in the butt. My son died at the hands of Antioch Police 2021. That's why I've been running down here. I've been trying to stop this. I've written Diana Beckton, I've written Bunta. Nobody listened to me. Nothing can bring my baby back. But to read in those texts, how they demoralized my baby. Feel like he died all over again. There are a lot, lots of family members like this, that this department has run amok over this community for many, many years. And there are people like this who call my office, who, who have a story to tell. And, and, and some of them are uh, long ago, and they want to know if anything can be done about it. The only thing that can be done now is a change in this department. There has to be a change, and that's what we're going to have to do. Yeah, no, sure. Hi. So I'm, I'm, here, I'm here for my, my brother-in-law, Guadalupe Zavala. Oh, yeah. um, he was shot 19 times. Um, while he was unarmed during um, the ending of a standoff. And uh, officers actually testified during the inquest hearing that they shot him the extra times because they thought he was playing possum. So that's just not right. It's not right. Explain how that happened. When they shot him 19 times, 
what was he doing? Was he armed? He was unarmed. He was unarmed at the time of the being shot. Um, did the officers recognize that they had shot him and he'd fallen and then they continued shooting? They, they, they did. They saw that he was already down. They saw that he was moving. They said that he was moving and shot him the extra times because they thought he was playing possum. So they made sure he was dead. Yeah, and the facts are complicated, I mean, to be honest with you. They're pretty complicated facts. The only thing, we know that there was an interchange of gun uh, early but at the time he was shot, he was coming out of the house, and he clearly was unarmed at the time. And there was no effort to try to subdue him other than just fire their weapons multiple times. That was the point, is that he was clearly unarmed, and they just had a barrage of shots. And even though there had been problems beforehand, he had been mental. It's a classic example, how do you deal with a mentally impaired person? Hopefully you don't shoot him, but one of the problems we do get, we've had a couple of cases with um, Antioch in that regard that um, mentally impaired people have died as a consequence of their interaction with uh, Antioch police. Hopefully this will change. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stephanie and I'm here speaking on behalf of my grandson. His name is Kevin Williams. And five years ago, he had no, he, he still doesn't, he, he has no record, he's never been to jail, he's never even have a ticket. And um, the, he was getting off the bark one day and had an anxiety attack. And the police got involved. He's never been a threat to himself or others, but the police hunted him down like an animal and a slave. They, had, they hunted him down like a dog. When they caught up with him, they tased him over 25 times. He was on the ground doing this, and they were still tasing him. They hit him in his head and in his face so many times, they took him to the hospital for an MRI. At the same time, they had him drug tested. No drugs, no alcohol in his system. They, the officers, you can hear them saying, oh man, I hit him in his head so many times, I thought my hand was going to break. They're actually saying this on, on, on the cam, you know? They, they dogged this young man out. Uh, after they took him to the hospital, they took, taking him to, um, uh, they taking him to jail. They taking him to jail and had the and had the nerve to charge him with um, battery on a police officer. Um, and we let him go to the state hospital for a little while, the little county hospital, mental health hospital. They gave him some medication that swole his feet up from a size 15 to a size 18. And it sent him all over the place. So we had to take him off that medication, and ever since then, he's been 100%, but he's so scared of the police, and the, uh, the, the cold part about it is he had just applied to be an Alameda uh, County Sheriff, or a police, whichever one. He was approved. He was given a date to take the agility test, and between that time, he went into his mental health. So I'm here to try to keep the police out of calls dealing with mental health issues because you think they do these people bad that don't have mental issues. Look at this video I have and see what they do to kids with mental health issues. Yeah. Thank You're you. Right. Another client. Yeah. One more client. Joshua Butler. Yeah, Joshua Butler. This is Joshua Butler, who's another plaintiff. Yeah. All right. Joshua. Give me your name. Oh yeah, my name is Joshua Butler. I've been a victim of the police, Antioch Police Department, since I was 14 years old, being harassed. As far as not just me, but my whole family. You know, um, it's hard for me to get a job. You know, because they put me on the news so much for like little cases, you know, I've been dealing with a lot. As far as this year, dealing with cases, 
being harassed, can't even sleep in my own house peacefully. You know, it's just like the whole family just being targeted. It's like, you know, at, at some point there gotta be an end to it. That's what y'all gotta say. Mm -hmm. Okay, you tell me what happened to you? Uh, Who was the officer? The officer is a uh, milliner. Milliner, Stinger, um, Josh Evans, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Matthews, and the list goes on. But every officer that's on my case that's right now is the people that's off on leave. So, you know, um, it just shows that I've been a victim, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Yes, sir. Okay, well, uh, anybody else have anything else you want? Oh. Hi, my name is Teresa Harris, and um, the Antioch police, I lived on Sycamore, on Limitry for 16 years. And my gra they used to harass my grandson all the time. I would be at work, they would call me from work to come get him, and what they would do is bring him down to the Antioch police department let them go, but I would have to take off from work to come get him. And um, I got a video of uh, when they had uh, a young man with a knee on his neck, and I just learned that he had died. My grandson said he thanked the poli uh, Antioch Police Department killed him. And, um, and I had got... I was getting harassed for trying to keep my grandson from over on uh, Pepper Tree because I would make him go home, you know, when he was younger. And so one day the police followed me home and said, what are you doing here? I said, I live here. And so they started going to the office complaining on me where I had to be uh, kicked out of my apartment because of my grandson steady going back and forth to Lemon Tree, but he lived there, that's where he grew up at. And um, and then another thing, I have a nephew that's mentally ill. They sick the dogs on him. I had him here, but he took off. Um, they would sick the dogs on him all the time. They would harass, they would, um, a friend of mine told me that she had a video where they threw my grandson on his head and one of the officers threatened to kill my grandson. And he said, Grandma, and he confronted the officer in front of me and said he told me he was gonna kill me at the age of 14. And I think that the Antioch Police Department um, targeted our youth, you know, targeted the youth because they uh, didn't have no words or no, they couldn't speak up for themselves. And I can speak up. The officer that she makes reference to, Amir, he's prominent in all of these, in all the, the verbalness that took place. I've had a number of cases with him. He's, in, he's, a, he's a canine officer, and, and he's particularly vicious in terms of how he uses the canine against individuals. I think that the, the county district attorney's office had called me about him because he really is notorious in terms of how he uses his canine uh, to, to um, brutalize individuals. Thank, Thank you. you. Some questions just you know, in terms of the scope of this. We have one more. You have one more or no? Yeah. Bit by the dogs and everything. All I was I would call the police department to have him come see him, but they didn't do nothing. Okay, we'll be talking about this case. Okay. All right, we have one more. <laughs> My son is over there somewhere. <laughs> 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 Okay, hi, my name is Leslie May. Um, I'm a resident here. I'm also the vice chair of the Contra Costa County Mental Health Commission. I myself have been victimized. 
uh, by the Antioch police most recently February of this year. Um, but I just want to speak on behalf of everyone that you've heard speaking here today that um, these violations are discrimination against people also with mental illness. Okay, it's a violation of Racial Justice Act and it's caused increased mental illness here in our community. I mean, even down to myself having to go get something so I can sleep because of the nervousness, the fear, and everything to even go out and socialize in our community, to have families and friends come to our homes to be attacked by the police to do all this. So it's a form of domestic terrorism, but it's also a violation of seniors' rights here in this community because it's not just these young people. It's people, it's seniors. Okay. Me at my age, 71 years young, you're, some of these mothers and these grandmothers you're hearing are in their 60s and 70s. We are seniors, we're elders in this community. So to instill this type of fear in us, it goes right back to when, in the 60s, when they did this down south in some places here in California. It's a fear to leave your home. It's a fear, I don't go out after dark. Uh -huh. I make sure that all my clients that I see at mental health, I do it early in the day and I'm home. And during the winter months, my oldest daughter would meet me at work to follow me home because you know it got dark around 536. So this is more, it's a broader issue than what you're hearing these people speak of. This is serious. We are under attack by this department. And I, for one, want to see federal oversight come in. And I hope anybody who has been injured by what they have done, if you're afraid to come out here in public, please contact this attorney and in private. Thank you. So you guys are probably the best, I guess, outfitted to answer this question in terms of how does this rank in comparison to what we saw with the writer scandal in Oakland and, and the OPD overall? Well, I'll tell you, as you know, I was on the writer's case. I've been there for 20 some years. The difference in the writer's case, that was like physical assault on a wide scale. And it was planting drugs on individuals. It was really bad and it had somewhat of a sanction. This is on a different level. We didn't have the verbal uh, debasement and uh, that here, here, that we didn't have that there that we have here. Uh, but they're still bad in the sense that it was a total lack of respect for the community itself. In Oakland, though, it was kind of limited to the west side, uh, west and north side. This is seen to be more widespread throughout the city. But the ver and the verbalness that, in terms of slurs and disrespect, that misogynistic, um, uh, homophobic, we didn't have those kind of statements being made. The people got beat up and drugs were planted on them. Here we have more beatings and a total lack of dis disrespect for the community. It's almost a hatefulness to the community. And that, confessions. Yeah, that we have here. And obviously people are talking about on a long term, we don't know all of that, but it looks like you got people being set up for false crimes, which are somewhat similar to Oakland. We certainly have racial profiling, so they admit to that. So there's a lot of similarities between them. Yeah. You kind of answered it before, but um, you know it's been a federal monitor now for two decades almost, and still there. Um, it, it doesn't have to be. <laughs> okay, I do think that there's a couple ways to go. I mean, the DOJ can come in like they have done on the, on the statute that I made reference to earlier, or there's the Office of Community Policing which comes in and make recommendations, or you have a private lawsuit that ultimately ends with some kind of resolution for injunctive relief and, and a form of uh, federal uh, monitoring by the court. That's, and that, um, that is like, likely to occur, can be. It, it doesn't have to be 20 years. The reason why it took 20 years is because they refused to do any work for 10, you know, because they didn't realize how serious we were. But we were determined and we're still there and all of them are gone. So uh, it can be done. The issue is here, can you get to the rot that exists within the department. Because we know at least 45 individuals were part of these texts. But that doesn't mean the other, ni other 55 weren't sharing the similar views. And the problem is, if you give it to that 45, 
what do you have left with the 55? Is that really just kind of spreading over the same conduct, or are they different? And that's the challenge the department's going to have. Who are these 55 people? I have a question. Out of the, 50, out of the 45 that were being investigated or implicated, are they all white officers? Uh, I don't think so. There's at least one black officer involved. As I was going through this, uh, he, uh, the, the community really speaks very negatively about him. Uh, but I did note that in all these negative connotations or racial connotations, all these, he was part of the, um, the Texas. And there's nothing that I have to suggest that he spoke up at all. The community people say that that's just how he is, that he wasn't, he was part of them and not us. One of the things I try to get people to understand is just because it's a black officer in and of itself doesn't then mean that they would be any different than a white officer. Once you put on a uniform, you ultimately, whatever that color that uniform is, officers tend to become that color. So. And another thing, um, all those, if all those officers that were implicated were found guilty. So their cases and the convictions will be vacated. Do you know how many cases are we talking well, about? Well, we don't know that. We years? don't know that. I know this, that in the Riders case, we did almost 100 cases had to be vacated. Okay? So uh, we don't know how many here that, that I don't know that just because of the racial story in itself means the case gets reversed. The question is what role did the officers play in that case in terms of the conviction. So it has to be analyzed. If they're, the fact, if they're the ones that gathered the facts of the, of, of the case, well, then that raises real questions about the credibility of it because you can't trust them. So I would think that that work has to be done uh, between the district attorney's office uh, and, and the local public defender and private counsel. When we were involved in it and the writers, we were involved in that, that process. Do you, have, yeah. do you have a number of how many cops are currently suspended? I hear that there's 45. 45 are actually off duty? Implicated. 45 implicated. Uh, of that, uh, I know it's at least 30. At least, at least 30 are on suspension? And do you, do you know what the department is doing to compensate? Are they going to the sheriff's department or CHP or I know that they want they had to go somewhere. I don't know where. Okay. But they've had to compensate for the loss of those officers. Do you have a number of what the, I, I know the numbers vary, but uh, as far as how many officers are on the Antioch Police Department? I, I heard it was like 110. 110, I've heard 99. 99. Yeah. Is it 99? I've heard 99. Okay. Well, it's, it's good. I've heard 45% of the officers are implicated. How many? A good 45%. John, we heard in the city council meeting um, people calling for hate crime charges. I know that you're not the district attorney, but do you see any of these crimes that they're plotting against people based on their color rising to a hate crime? And then also, since they um, plan well, these crimes with race. each other, could I, it be I conspiracy? Think it's, all it's all hatefulness because if it's either race, it's misogynistic, it's homophobic, those are all hate crimes. And, and, and the way people use those languages and throw them around and refer them to various people in these kind of way, there's a hatefulness that, that's part of that. So being a hate crime is a very easy uh, jump to me. Yeah. It doesn't matter as much because you got to prosecute these people no matter what, and, and the victim's got to get them out of here, and you got to decertify so they can't be police officers elsewhere. That's, that's is there a possibility of the statute of limitations being lifted on some people's cases so yeah, that they I, can well, um, no question, reopen them? No, no question. We have to work through the statute of limitations question because some of these go way back, and I don't so. Unlike some of the sex cases that were years gone by, they did, in fact, through the state legislature, toll the statute of limitations. Statute of limitations. That hasn't worked here, but that, that's an issue that has to be worked on. It's a big issue, too, because a lot of these people didn't know that they were being harmed. And, and so, I mean, they just accepted the misconduct. You know, they didn't know that they had rights or that anybody cared about those rights. And so that's what we have to see how far back we can go and we can get done. I did have a case once where the police hid that information, a uh, case I did, and uh, a Jerry Amaro case, and as a consequence, even after the statute had run, uh, we were able to go back and do the case because they had hid the information. So there might be a fix here. Yeah. So how much are you seeking in damages in this lawsuit for I the so The money have not raised that question, okay. uh, and so I don't know about that. Okay. I don't normally file cases with the damage amounts involved. I will tell you that, to me, Money is always an issue in some cases, but this is a case where we're looking more, and like I did in the writer's case, I was more about the reform than anything else. That's why I've been involved in this case for 20 years. 
and even though it was some money, there wasn't so much money. But to me, the reform question is you, you want the people that are living in the town so they don't have to worry about the police treating them like they're citizens. And so money, the reform is what's more important. Sometimes that can cost more, but it, that's really important. Is there a ballpark amount? Or are no, you saying there's no ballpark. Are you looking into Pittsburgh at all? Uh, we haven't been contacted on Pittsburgh, so no. I know that Pittsburgh and, and uh, Antioch have officers who are being investigated jointly because of their joint criminal misconduct. And um, um, we're not involved in those cases. Okay. Not, not yet. Okay.